house of the Lord with you this morning. And I know that there are some things in this busy season as we celebrate graduations and completing school years and proms, as we anticipate the summer and maybe some rest and relaxation and some vacations, even in the midst of all that celebration, there are some trials here this morning. There are some struggles here this morning. There are struggles with addiction and mental health, and there are marriage struggles, and there are some struggles with your children and relational. Some of us are struggling to connect with God. And this morning, I want to invite you to speak Jesus over every area of your life. Speak Jesus over your hurts. Speak Jesus over your fears. Speak Jesus over your anxiety. Just speak the name of Jesus. There is no other name under heaven or earth by which we can be saved. It is the name over every name. So I want you to stand. I don't want to get lost in the presence of God as you cry out to Jesus.
Can you believe that we get to do this every week? How incredible is it to be in the house of the Lord? Like, where else would you want to be other than with God's people singing His praises? Right? It breaks my heart that there are towns and communities right here on Long Island that doesn't have this. 
that there are places all over the country and the world that don't have a local church to come together and experience God's presence new and afresh as a community every week. It just reaffirms my desire that we will be a church that multiplies all across the world. And people need this. Do you need this today? Am I the only one who needs this this morning? Father, thank you that you tell us you inhabit the praises of your people and your word never lies. That we feel your tangible presence in a way when we come together that we can't get anywhere else. That there's something that you have decided will happen in biblical community that changes lives and generations. And I do ask, Lord, that we would not take this for granted. It is so easy to go home and to get back on the hamster wheel and get so distracted. Father, keep us seeking the divine. Keep us running after, Father, your grace and your mercy and coming together in community and serving others and loving others. Father, let us be the foot washers of Port Jeff Station. Let people know that this is a place where you will be loved, you will be accepted, and that we will always be here because you have always been here for us. Help us to be that body of your son, Jesus Christ, as we follow him in this world, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, and God's people said, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So over the past few weeks and months, we've been in a series called Be the Church, um, so I'm really excited. One of the things that may happen with this series is we may be turning this series into a national small group curriculum with a few other churches. So that's very, very exciting that we had a chance to impact other local houses across the country. Um, this week, we're going to take a break from that series, and we're going to have someone bring us a word who's been a part of our church uh, from a distance for a long time. So at the very beginning, as God started to call our church to multiplication and planting and revitalization and serving other churches, God brought Pastor Nicholas Weeks into my life. He is a faithful brother who loves the Lord. He loves the local church. Um, he loves his wife so much that they have six kids. So pray for her. Rochelle is here. <laughs> Where's Linda Bergman that you're clapping so hard, Drew? She's in the nursery. That's why he's clapping. Uh, so Pastor Nick serves at Church at the Rock in Canarsie, Brooklyn. And he's a personal friend. And we just welcome him this morning to Cornerstone. It's certainly a pleasure to be here with the saints again at Cornerstone and Pastor Mike and the elders here. Thank you for the opportunity again to uh, open the word of God with you in the Lord's day. Well, as you know, and we were just talking about around this time of the year, uh, many parents are excited, excited because it's a time of the year where graduation is, is all around us and uh, parents are celebrating uh, the achievement of their youngsters from high school through college finally coming to the end of the road and moving on to other things. And it's also exciting because as graduation and school stops, work begins. And many parents are looking forward to the next step on, on work and uh, going on into our culture to be uh, contributors to our society. And part of that in this celebration time, what you will find is a lot of families uh, come together, especially at dinner time, especially around the table, to have a moment of connection, to have a moment of relationship. You see, the dinner table is a place where people come together. You know, it's not too uh, out of the ordinary when a husband wants to have a special connection with his wife, he'll take her out to a very nice restaurant. And th that's something that, that men do to make that special connection with, the, with their spouse, the person that they've committed their lives to. You see, that dinner table is a place where peace can occur, where exchange can happen. And if you go way back in 1529, June 16th, 
There was a time where a dinner table served as a place of peace. It was the war between the Catholics and the Protestants when Jacob Kaiser, who was a Reformation priest, he came out of Catholicism and he went against the traditional Catholic orthodoxy such as papal infallibility. And as you know, as Christians, the Pope is not, you know, the Pope is a man like us. All men under the lordship of Jesus Christ are sinners. So Jacob Kaiser believed that. And in his belief, he wanted to share this message that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And he went out, out of Protestant areas into Catholic territory. The result of that led to Jacob being burned at the stake. And that also led to a conflict. You see, both sides took up arms, marching right there in Capel, Switzerland, about 42 miles uh, west of Zurich, and war was imminent. They were gung-ho and fighting. What happened was as they got to the battlefield and as the negotiations were taking place um, on the other side, both sides actually sat down to eat. And the food that was shared was milk, soup, and bread. What brought them together at that time that averted a war, a religious conflict, was being across from each other at that dinner table. And war was averted that time because they took on an invitation to get to know one another. This morning in our passage in Luke chapter 14, we see an invitation that is given to us from a man that Jesus introduces us to as he's going through uh, some of his parables there in Luke chapter uh, 14. If you turn there with me in Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 24, Jesus introduces a man who gives a great invitation. And as you read through it, you'll see a man who has a big heart, a man who is hospitable, a man who is honorable, and a man who wants to invite someone to his table to get to know him in a, in a very intimate way. Listen as I read out of Luke chapter 14. Then he said to them, Jesus is speaking, a certain man gave a great supper and, though, and, and, and invited many and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, for all things are now ready. But they with all accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have brought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask that you have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city. Bring in here the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you have commanded, and there is still room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, for my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper." This parable is the parable of the great invitation to supper. And as you go through this parable, you see that the parable is almost a mirror image of God himself. You see, God offers us an invitation to not only us, but to the whole world of eternal life. He invites us to his banquet and table where there is, where there is peace, where there is love, where there is an exchange of relationship. And in this parable, you see each one of the people saying no to that invitation. Many today in our culture are no different from some of the people that rejected this invitation. In our culture, we see that the invitation to Jesus Christ is rejected in many ways. Some even go out far out as outright trampling on the invitation from God to a relationship with him. At the tail end of this month, June 25th, the past 25 days, was a whopper. We see our culture in complete spiral, where people are rejecting 
the imagi deo. They are rejecting the design of God for some of the basic things. That God has made us into male and female. That God has made marriage for a man and a woman. We see a culture that is saying to God, his invitation in, in basic humanity, I don't want any part of it. The culture is saying to God, you stay over here, and I'll stay over here. We don't want to get to know you. In many ways, as you read through this parable, it's no different that one of the words that, as you read through it, that strikes out at you is this word excuses. The word is repeated three times. So there's something going on. It's a word that, to many of us, is easily recognizable. It's a word that, at one point in our lives, all of us, at some point, may have made an excuse. And in a moment of giving the excuse, we realize that we are given an excuse. It's a word that mothers can detect instantaneously. You know, the kids are at the table, and mom steps out of the room for a couple of minutes, and you come back, you see milk all over the table, and you start asking your child what's going on, and in the explanation, you could see there is a hesitation to tell exactly what happened, and excuses bubbling up. It's a word that bosses and managers have very, very little patience for. It's a word that fathers can see from a mile away as it's being mustered up. Excuses is something that we need to be very careful about, but it's something that many people do as a manner of justifying sin. In this parable, the, the offer to come to the table is given by this man, but the excuses can, uh, come popping out. You see, the rejection of, of Jesus and, and excuses has gone back from the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 3, that is when the, the first excuse for sin was unleashed into this world. Adam turned to Eve, Eve turned to the serpent. And ever since, excuses has been pouring out to make light of sin to say that sin is not as bad, to say that sin is not something that will drag our souls into the judgment of God outside of us turning to the mercy of Jesus Christ. We may hear these excuses in our time that may be, on its face, may seem almost valid. Someone may come up to you and say, well, your views on marriage in this day and age, are you not being a little unreasonable? Don't you have to update the language of the Bible to accommodate what's going on in our culture today? It's an excuse. It's an excuse to not to conform our lives to the Word of God. You hear this, that the times are, are changing. But that's okay. The times can change. The issue is God is a God who doesn't change. And because God doesn't change, we cannot use excuses to justify sin. God doesn't want us to conform to the times. God wants us to conform to him. Why? Because God is holy, and we are not. You might hear the excuse common for, for young people today, this one, you know, we were moving in, and we were just moving in to get to know one another. And you ask the follow-up questions, are you, are you guys getting married? Silence. Excuses for sin is something that we have to identify and go to the Word of God to deal with head-on. In Romans chapter 1, and going on verses 20 to 23, you see the, uh, the Apostle Paul laying out that in reality, there's no excuse that is something that we can give to justify sin. And the apostle goes on to say, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
Because although they knew God, they did not justify him as God, nor were they thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, excuses leads to foolishness. It leads to more and more darkening of our minds. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, and birds, and four-footed animals, and creeping things. That is the end which, which, by which excuses lead us to if we don't deal with it head on. The parable goes on to give us the reasons for the, these excuses, and we'll be working through them one by one. The first excuse that was given was because of land. It says, I have bought a piece of ground, or if you look at the translation, field, that I may go and see it. I ask that you have me excused. Now, as you look at the context of this excuse, it doesn't make sense on its face. It, it shows the man's value. It shows that the man was caught up with the lust of the eyes. In, in 1 John chapter 2.16, it says, For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh. You can almost picture the man going around, searching the ground, and wondering, what is he looking at? If you see somebody looking at the ground, you may walk up to them and try to nudge them gently and say, what, what are you doing? Well, that's what he was doing. And in the context of, that, of the first century, most people would not buy a piece of ground sight unseen. It's not like they had Zillow back then. He had already seen the ground. He was trying to make an excuse to, to get out of going to this dinner table of this great man. The world can seem like so much to many people. The world, the things in the world, the opportunities in, this, in the world can seem like so much that we can run and grab it. But in Mark chapter 8, like this man, Jesus warns us, he said, what shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world but in the end forfeit his soul? We are not trying to gain the world. As Christians, we are trying to gain Christ. We are trying to gain an imperishable crown. We are trying to get to know Jesus and the fellowship of his sufferings. We want Jesus not to be looking on the ground. We want to be looking up to him. One Christian, an older man that I know, um, used to say often that this world is like a big mud ball. So keep it in perspective. Keep it in perspective, it's a big mud ball. The second excuse was that of the yoke. The yoke was used to put around the necks of animals, and it would be used for making work a lot easier. It would, it, it would increase the pulling power of those animals, and, and life would be a lot easier having the yoke. And it was a convenient thing. Just imagine today you're trying to get your work done and you don't have a smartphone. You're trying to move around and you don't have the convenience of, 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 the, of a smartphone. That was the yoke of that time for many of the people that were working. And this guy said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I am going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. Now, if you notice, both the land excuse and the, and the yoke excuse both of them are, be, are being very respectful. Both of them are saying, I ask that you have me excused, but still no thanks. I'm not coming. See, someone who is religious is very, very respectful. Religiosity can be promote respectability, but that doesn't mean in your heart you have that relationship with Jesus Christ. And in the context, Jesus is given this illustration here as a rebuttal to the scribes and the Pharisees, if you know they were the religious authority at that time. You see, the Pharisees were respectable to a point that they would not even sit at the table with wine bibbers and tax collectors. And Jesus coming in would sit down with people like Zacchaeus. Jesus would sit down with sinners of whom I'm the chief. The things in this world that make life more convenient can be as a block to seeing our perspective on this world. We should be holding this world loosely. G 
Jesus even gives us an understanding of this principle in, in, uh, as you look at the Sabbath law, and, and it's almost related to the yoke, where he said the Sabbath was made, for, was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. In the same way, the yoke was not created, the man was not created for the yoke. The yoke was created for man, so we have to keep it in the right perspective. There are many things in this life that come at us through convenience. And that can be a hindrance in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That can tamper the Holy Spirit being sent by God to convict us of our sin. Because it's so convenient. And if you talk to some people that are so convenient in this world, and you try to dialogue with them about Jesus Christ, they may look at you kind of in a fog and say, why do I need Jesus? Life is going good. And as you press them and you ask them more, they, I'm a good person. Why do I need God? Jesus gives us an example of a, a man later in Luke chapter 18 that was in a place of convenience. And convenience can mean that you don't really see the nature of yourself before God. You don't really see why Jesus is the Holy One of Scripture, why He is the sent one, why He is the perfect sacrifice of this world. This world is a vapor. And one day we will be with Jesus, or one day He will be judging us, and we don't want to tell Jesus on that day when He judges us that Sin was so convenient, I couldn't let it go. In Luke 18, he gives us the example of this, this man. He, and the man came up to Jesus with a very respectable question. The man said, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, all these things I've kept from my youth. When Jesus heard that, he said to him, you still lack one thing. There's one thing that is too convenient for you to let go. The man in instead turned away very sorrowful, according to Luke chapter 18. He was sorrowful because he was very rich. He was very rich in the conveniences of this world. Sometimes for us, it's not what we have to gain in this world, that is the problem. It's being content with what God has given us. And that contentment can lead to us striving to go out of the yoke and the oxen because it is so convenient. The third excuse that was given in the parable was that of the wife. And as you read this one, it's an odd one. It's one that you think to yourself, I can't believe you would give an excuse that my wife. But that's what it's there. It says, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. He actually, that was the excuse. And as you think about it, you might say to yourself, this is one that actually could work before God. If you were to give an excuse of not to be in a relationship with God, it would be because of, of, of your wife. But to God, that's not even one that can hold any water. You see, to God, our spouses come second. To God, our spouses come second. We cannot put anything to, before God. Not our work, not our play, not anything. Everything comes second and God comes first in our lives. And that changes your perspective on life. When God is first... And God calls you into a relationship with him. It prioritizes everything. He is the one that is the apple of your eye. He is first, and everything pales into comparison. In Mark chapter 10, in understanding this, that Jesus would not even accept a wife as an excuse, Jesus tells them in Mark chapter 10, Assuredly, I say to you, there is... No one who has left brother or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels, who shall not inherit a hundredfold now in this time? See, as you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's only gain. He gives you more in this time and in the time to come. 
He fills your life with him and with other meaningful relationships. Nothing should hinder us from coming into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not even the one in this world that we may hold more dearly to our wife or our husband or whatever it is. That cannot keep us from coming to God. Recently, I was having a conversation with a, a man who is a gospel conversation, um, and he was very open. He came from a Jewish background, and he um, hadn't understood that why Jesus had to come into this world. And in the conversation, he was very open to wanting to know about Jesus. He, he understood the Torah. He understood some of the Sabbath laws and a lot of the system of Judaism, but he couldn't understand Jesus. He didn't even know about Isaiah chapter 53. So in the conversation, I'm sharing with him, this is why Jesus is the Messiah. This is why we are trusting him. This is why he came in the fullness of time. This is why he lived. This is why he died. And this is why you must accept him. In the conversation, his wife was there. She said, why can't you just live in such a way where you don't try to convert other people? Now, to a postmodern ear, in a postmodern world, that might seem like a, a reasonable thing to say. But as Christians, we are not, we can't convert anyone. As Christians, we are sharing the message that can lead to somebody being changed to Jesus Christ. It's the message that changes us. We can't do that in our own power. They didn't want to deal with the reality of accepting Jesus Christ, much like the scribes and the Pharisees. And unfortunately, he didn't get closer to this relationship with Jesus because he was being hindered. When you look at the life of Jesus, there is no excuse. There's nothing that can be put forth to discredit who Jesus was. And the scribes and the Pharisees, as Jesus was given this illustration, they were desperately trying to discredit his ministry. And each time they were coming up empty-handed. There was nothing that could be presented that could say Jesus was not the one of the scriptures. And as you go down the list, for the scribes and the Pharisees, they accused him of being a sinner. He was not a sinner. He was a perfect man. He was the one that could be worshipped in spirit and truth. Jesus was the one that is the perfect ruler. He can usher in a perfect government. He is the one that will never disown us. He will be a friend that stick as clo sticks close to us than anybody that we know. There is nothing that they can bring up that could paint Jesus as one that was not who he was claiming to be. He was the real deal. However, excuses can come into our lives, can come into the conversation to try to block that reality from our minds, from our eyes. And we live in a culture that is working hard to pop up every single excuse that there is to continue in a life of sin. We have to ask ourselves, how do we come into that invitation from Jesus Christ? What should those people have said at that invitation? They should have said, yes, 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 I want to come to your dinner table. I want to sit across from you. I want, to get to know, I want you to get to know me. I, I appreciate the privilege of you inviting me into that relationship. That is the way we come to this relationship with Jesus Christ. We, we come to Jesus with a sense of thankfulness, but it leads us by way of repentance and faith. We, we cry out to God and, and we ask God, God, please show us. Show me why I need to sit at your dinner table, God. Why I need this relationship. Because if we are not crying out to God in brokenness over our sin, over our excuses, we'll miss the point. We'll come to Jesus on a mystical term. We'll come to Jesus not understanding, not understanding the way of the cross, the way of Calvary. In Psalm 34 and 6, it says, the poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. 
we are crying out at this invitation, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. Be merciful to me, O God, a sinner, to come to your banquet and table, to come into your presence, to come into a relationship with you, Jesus. And I'm coming to you not wanting to make any excuses to turn away from a lifestyle that I need to turn away from. The servant, though, in light of this great invitation, came back in verse 21, and his report was not a good one. Many today reject this invitation to come to God, and it can be discouraging. It can be discouraging as you're sharing with family and friends that Jesus is the way to eternal life. Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the way to deal with the major issue of your life today. That's Jesus Christ. And many could, many seem to, I just don't know what to do with that. And, you know, it just kind of rolls off their back. And to this man, the master who was giving out the invite, he could have simply reclined and said, well, they, they didn't want to come. But that's not what we see in the master. In verse 21, we see a, a man who was still passionate about wanting people to get that invitation. He said, so the servant came back and reported these things. Then the master of the house being angry. Is there a sense in your heart that there is a passion to win those who don't know Jesus, who don't come into a relationship with him? He was angry, and he said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets, into the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed, the lame, and the blind. In other words, go into the streets. Go everywhere and tell them that there is hope available in Jesus Christ. That is the charge of the Christian. I want to encourage you, the Christians today. Don't be discouraged of sharing this truth. This is the only message that could save this world. Jesus Christ. This is the only me message that could bring people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Jesus Christ. This is the only place there is a banquet and table that men and women can be saved from the wrath to come. One day this world will end. You know, that might be bad news for people who are holding strongly to climate change. But this world will end. But we have a message that will usher people into an, an ending life, into eternity. It's a message that is so good that we cannot neglect our duties to share it here and all around the world. That Jesus Christ wants people, wants you and me to invite others to his banquet and table. If you've been saved, if you have gone to that banquet and table, you know what it means to have fellowship with God. You know what it means to hunger and thirst after righteousness. You know what it means for Jesus to satisfy your soul. You know what it means to receive forgiveness for sin that only God knows. He can restore our soul. He can cleanse us. And we have no excuse not to come to him. I pray this morning that you would be confident to share this message. I pray this morning that no matter what excuse, you would say to God, no. No. I need to go to you. I need to surrender to you. I need to look to you. Let's look to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you, God, that you are an everlasting God. We thank you, God, that your word is active and alive even today. That you, Jesus, can save our souls from the wrath to come. We pray, God, that you would hide your word in our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship him.
is well with my soul because Jesus said here I am I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and eat with that person and they with me thank you Pastor Weeks for sharing such a wonderful message about that relationship but beyond that, the excuses that we have for not sharing with others that relationship and living the way Jesus wants us to live. He said, we love because he first loved us. And he loved us so much that he went to the cross for us and died for us. And yet we, we hold it in. My mom, I think it was my mom used to say, Excuses, excuses, excuses. And I don't know if you remember that, Nancy. It might have been just in my childhood, but we had three boys in the family, so it was probably mostly aimed at me, but... Or Brent, probably Brent too, right? <laughs> yeah, Brent. But, um, yeah, so what, you know, let's pray this morning. Let's pray now. Let's continue to pray ask God, what are our excuses? What are they? And, and it's really usually the world. And I was convicted as you were sharing that. And you said the world seems like so much. Right? It seems like so much. That was the key word. But then your, your brother shared with you that it's really just a big mud hole. And you really, if you compare the world to eternity, eternal life, that friendship with God, that love, that grace, what he did for us, heaven, a relationship now, the rest is really just a mud hole. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. If you were touched by the sermon and today, please uh, re-watch and share it. Um, watch it on a Facebook, on, there we go, the Facebook, the website and Facebook and the YouTube page. And to connect with us, write down this following number, 631-201-5520. Save it on your phone as Cornerstone. And if you want to be added to that list, just text CHURCH. There's also other ways that you can interact with us in the comments uh, behind us, behind me. All weekly event ministry information is on the app. The app is really cool. Go to the App Store, church, go to Church Center, and put our zip code in, and you'll find Cornerstone. Everything is there. It's also good for sharing. I've used that to, if I don't remember something, I just open up the app and say, oh, look, here's the, here's the uh, young adult ministry or what have you. So it's right there for you. No excuses. If you have received Jesus, we have a gift for you at the information desk. We have a New Believers Bible. Please, 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 and the pastor begs, and, and we love that, that if you received Jesus this morning, if you heard that message of Jesus standing at the door and knocking on your heart and wanting to have that relationship with you, and you said, you know what, I don't have any more excuses. I want to run to that table. I want to, I want to receive Jesus into my heart now, or you did that this morning. I want you, Lord. Oh, I don't understand everything, but... I know that you died for me, and I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't fix that, but you did on the cross, 
but I need to come to you. I need to go to that meal and sit with you. If you did that today, fill out a card and write Jesus on it. We want to know. We want to uh, interact with you. We want to reach out to you. We want to minister to you, disciple you. Sports camp is coming up. <laughs> whoa, that's right. Whoa. <laughs> Uh, sports camp is the 17th through the 21st. Good vibes only. I love it. Good vibes. <laughs> uh, it's always great. Last year was amazing. And so 117 kids or something like that came. That's just a, a lot of lives and a lot of souls. So praise God. And many of them did come to the Lord that we know of. So pray, and that's the ones that we know of. So please sign up in the back to volunteer. Again, that's the 17th through the 21st. If you can only do one day, great. If you could do five days, great. Two, three, whatever. If you can't throw a baseball or a basketball or whatever, we could use anything. Food. If you want to just walk around and pray, and I've shared this before, but Troy just walked around a few times. We won't talk about Troy's baseball skills up here, but he would just walk around and pray. We prayed for certain people. We saw lives change. So whatever you can do, please. Uh, if you need any other information, the information desk is on the right as, as you walk out. Uh, Christine will be there uh, if you need anything. Prayer teams, of course, as always, will be up front. Take advantage of that if you need prayer or if you want to pray about something. If you want to come up and, and talk to one of the prayer counselors about receiving the Lord, if you don't quite understand that fully, please just ask. Ask, ask any of us, please. Today is the day of salvation. Please don't wait. And just give them some, some space because sometimes there's some you know, confidential things being shared. So, Father, we're so grateful for you. As Pastor said in the beginning, we're just so thankful we could come here each week and be in your presence and hear from you and sing to you and talk to you and get to know you just a little bit better. Thank you for the worship team. Thank you for the work they put into the excellence that they bring forth each week and that they're expressing the relationship with you each week. Thank you for this day. Again, thank you for Pastor Weeks. Thank you for his faithfulness, his obedience. Um, that was a challenging and convicting message conviction comes from you so help us to hear from you help us help me to identify more of my excuses to getting closer to you and to sharing you with others we love you we thank you we praise you and it's all in your name it's all in jesus mighty name and everyone said amen praise god